Welcome everybody to our first official video covering the Vote Chess match taking place right now on Chess.com between John Urschel, the man you can see right above me here, and uh, the world. Of course, I'm on John's team. We know that he has the final say-so, and I'm sure he could probably fire me if he wanted to as his coach, and we'll see how he feels about it after our first lesson. The way this format is going to work is I'm going to be reviewing the game with John. We're going to be diving into analysis like you would see a chess master do with a student in a real setting and and it's going to provide that sort of practical analysis format where you get back and forth feedback that probably many of our viewers have never really had access to before similar to videos that I maybe did for Hutch over at his YouTube channel for those who are regular followers at chess.com and on that note here let's uh, let's let's bring John on here and, and ask him how do you feel about the game so far I feel good about it I mean uh play e4 i expect sicilian right uh, i like c3 you know i don't like deep deep theoretical lines you just like you just like deep deep mathematics but not I like deep deep, deep, deep chess mathematics theory. not you know deep right. deep chess theory i like to play kind of fresh ish positions right so, so i go c3 so you have the magnus carlsen approach to openings you want to start playing real chess and not prepare chess as soon as possible i mean if we can put his name and my name in the same sentence, which I don't quite feel comfortable with. But if you want to call it that, now I'm gonna I'm gonna put you in Magnus's league at least as far as your opening approach. And you know, if he's got issues with that, then that means he's watching, right? Yeah. Um, so the, uh, the the world played the move d5, and and for those who don't know, um, there are a few main options here for Black. Uh, John and I, in our preparation for the match, anticipated the Sicilian yeah. or e5 as being likely the the two. The two likely choices from the world. Um, so the other lines that can occur are knight to f6, of course, uh, which is the other, if you want to be positional about it, way to expose the pawn on c3, right? This pawn takes away natural developing moves from white. And so black can put pressure on e4 and, and try, to, try to force white to maybe accelerate and create a, a center that can be undermined later. Uh, and the other way to do it is to play d5, which brings the queen out early. Normally a no-no is actually a go-go because, uh, go-go, I just did that, okay, because the knight can't go to c3, right? right? So, but John was, John, you're, you're still, you're not in the woods yet. I mean, you know what you're doing here and you just, you went right ahead, right? Yeah, straight d4. I mean, that's typical. Things that they respond with are things like knight c6, mm -hmm. knight f6. Sometimes they can play e6. I mean, these are these are the common things. Right. And so the typical decision in the game happened around uh, the world did play knight f6, as John said, and it happens here in terms of the structure because there's really there's really two types of games you can get here, and that is at some point white is is just developing the pieces and black eventually blinks first taking on d4 and what we get is an isolated queen pawn position so for example knight f3 is is probably the most theoretically common move here and and knight black often common. plays bishop to g4 um there's a number of moves here still including i think just about everything under the sun has been played here from bishop e2 to even h3 right away to knight a3 uh, we didn't get for this we didn't get to this but in terms of the overall lessons i want to kind of provide for john and the audience watching i wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what's o what the overall plans are in this position so we can get to talking about what's going on in the game and what's different about that. Uh, so, so do you know, John, wh who the who the top players are that play this line as white, regardless of knight f3? In, in the game, we know you played the move d takes c5, a less common move, uh, but a move with uh, some real positional grounding. Uh, and but, but do you know who the top players are regu regularly playing the Alapin Sicilian here? Well, I have read parts of the uh the complete c3 sicilian book okay so i would naturally put him as the top player of it considering okay. you know, who's the author of that book it's a uh, it's a name i cannot pronounce is it is i believe it's rosenthalis nope starts with an s but i'm going to butcher it it starts with an f s hmm zvagensev no it's you know what I'm just gonna go for it, and I'm gonna butcher the name. Okay. And it is. What is Sveshnikov? Oh, Sveshnikov. Sveshnikov. Yeah. Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, you are. Uh, Svej, uh 
top, not the young one. It's always better to just like go into your to your Russian past lives and let the accent come out. Sveshnikov, yeah. We want Sveshnikov. to blow up the Xbox, yeah. Um, so that's it, Sveshnikov. Yes, uh, the, no, but I, I should have known Sveshnikov. I actually was already ready to quiz you with that, who are the top players who play the Alipin uh, question, because it's actually a really good takeaway for all the viewers at home that – one of the things I, I, I told you in one of our little off-the-record chess lessons was you want to know who all the STEM players are that play your line, right? Yeah. You want to know who the top players are that are regularly featuring your openings so that you can make an effort to follow those players a little more closely. Uh, all of us chess enthusiasts would love to say that we have 10 hours a day to cover every game, but the truth is you don't. So how do you prioritize which top players you cover and which you don't? Well, I think that one of the best ways to do it is to try to latch on to people that regularly play your openings, and that's just, you know, that's free advice, hashtag pro tip for the fans. So some, some players who are regularly playing the Alapin at the high levels are guys I named, Rosenthalis, uh, Zvagenzev, um, uh, Tibiakov used to, used to be a, a regular Alapin connoisseur um and, and of course it's been played by others but i think that those guys uh, let's see I, I i did a i did a search before uh before the game uh before our lesson here to come up with some others berkus uh who's i think is a german gm b-e-r-k-e-s is one uh vallejo pawns Spanish GM, somebody who's also played in Alapin. So those are people that are really important for you to latch on to because even if they don't play the D-take-C5 line, as, as I told you, I mean, the decisions they're making are always theoretically relevant if they're a strong grandmaster who plays your opening regularly, right? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm familiar with the main guy who does play D-take-C5, although sadly I don't think, I'm not sure what's to be gained there. You know this guy, uh, Afro Meev, the guy who was like in that, uh, Af uh, Afromeyev, yeah. In, in fact, um, I was yeah. just going to get to DTX C5. Uh, 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 an author on Chess.com, Alyssa Melikina, uh, she's not the not the strongest overall player when talking about these strong GMs, but Alyssa plays this line in the database. But uh, Afromeyev, yeah, he seems to be the, the highest rated GM consistently playing DTX C5. Well, uh, not quite GM, though. Are you familiar with like the drama around that guy? I'm not actually. Tell me, do tell. This is great. Yeah, there, like there's some chess drama back way back when he was like rated like number 60 something in the world. He's got this rating and he's uh FM. And the like alleged thing is this guy's like buying rating points in Russia. Like hosting his own tournaments where wow. like things are fixed or like Claiming tournaments happened that didn't even happen. Sounds like you sounds like you latched on to a real model citizen as your STEM oh, yeah. guy. I picked a good one. Right? So when we go through his games, we're gonna have to, you know, kinda Yeah, we'll we'll take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. Well, I mean he's still he's still a strong player. Uh yes. but unfortunately, yeah, he's not um that that doesn't seem like the best reputation no. to have as somebody who's fixing tournaments. Yeah. So. Um speculation wow. though. Speculated. Yeah, spe speculating, right? Kind of like, kind of like uh, the Ravens speculating about how much time the rookies are getting, right? Exactly. Are we allowed to talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I love it. I, I think some of the football fans might appreciate that, and then others are others are not so happy. All right, so here we go. We have D take C five played by John, and I'm gonna make the next few moves because they're pretty obvious. The queen recaptures. Trading on D1 is is likely not the best solution for black because despite ruining white's opportunity to castle without the queens on the board, one, not a big issue. Number two, black isn't really guaranteed winning back this pawn here. White's going to aggressively play B4 and happily take uh, a pawn advantage into the endgame. So the world played queen takes C5. They know what they're doing, right? And after bishop E3 with tempo, queen to C7 and knight A3, Black is uh, having to deal with the threat of knight to b5, so we're expecting the world to play a6. But now comes the real time where we get to dive into some meat, help John prepare himself sort of positionally and strategically. He's already doing a lot of preparation on his own, making these moves, really without any advice from me so far, right? You've been flying solo. Oh, yeah. The, the baby bird's been out of the nest. I mean, you feel good, right? 
yeah, I'm feeling good about this. He feels good. I mean, he's got he's got another good buddy who who gives him chess advice. One named Bobby Hess, but um, we know who his favorite is. So, all right. So we got we got a six coming from the world. But what I want to quiz you with, John, is so regardless of the theory here, give me an overall of how you're evaluating your plan as white as you head into the middle game here. You're, you're going to be transitioning from the stage of let's get developed in the opening to making sure everybody is placed with a purpose, right? Development is about is about just getting your pieces out, but planning is about developing pieces with a purpose. So tell me what the goal is here for White and what your plan is over the coming moves. Okay, so here's what I'm thinking. First of all, I've got a little bit of a developmental advantage, uh-huh. I feel like. I, uh, exactly. Okay. I am definitely not castling queenside, that's like out. Okay. Uh, let's see. Knight f3 seems like a natural place to put the one knight. Uh, bishop could go to e2 or d3, although I'm thinking e2. A move like knight c4 is something that could be in the works in the future. I'd like to get a rook on that d file, that open file, and start putting pressure that way. Okay. And those are kind of some of my initial thoughts. So who do, you think, who do you think is better here in the long run, and why? Well, I think it's about even. Okay, and what makes you say that? What are the imbalances well, that make you feel like the position's equal? Oh, hold on. We've got a visitor. Louisa. She can say hi. You can say hi if you hi. want. Hi, Louisa. She's back from D.C. She's back from D.C. She had a radio show for her book. Hey there. Hey, sorry, I just, oh, I, I just thought that was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're doing. Yeah, yeah we're we're, we're in a live video, so. All and right, you don't want so, to be known to the fans. Yes, back to work. So, I think it's about even. I mean, I have a little bit of an advantage in development. I do have a queenside majority, mm-hmm. which later in the game is something that I think I could try to take advantage of. Okay. But short term, I'm thinking getting my pieces placed on good squares, seeing how black develops, and then see what goes from there. Okay. So, it's good. I wanted to quiz you about all that stuff just to get uh, an idea of, of the framework that we're, we're operating with here. And I think that... Um, so overall, I mean, okay, everything you said is true and, and makes sense. And, and But by definition, if you have a three-on-two majority, that means black has a... A four on three, right? Right. And so, one of the advantages Black has in this structure, I'll let you tell me. What are, what are, what is one of the biggest positional advantages Black has in this in this position? Biggest positional advantages. Tell me. I don't know. So, one of the things that happens in. Um, in an opening, uh, uh, this isn't really a romantic style opening where there's been a lot of open lines and, and peace trades, but it is a position where a certain amount of the center has already been liquidated. And yes. so when you're evaluating these positions, usually this is the case. Whenever someone has a three on two, what their opponent usually has is more of a middle game positional advantage because that means they have a four on three. Now, mm-hmm. why is a four on three more effective than a three on two in the middle game? For a few reasons. One, by definition, that usually means they are the one with the only center pawn on the board. So, why is a center pawn more valuable? Well, we all know that pieces in the center will have more potential power than those not. And so, if someone has a pawn in the center, they're restricting your access to center squares that you are unable to restrict for them. At least not in terms of with a pawn. Okay? So, like, Nimzovich had, you know, if we're going, like, basic chess philosophy, Nimzovich valued pawns in the center as, like, two or one and a half points versus pawns that aren't. Now, it was based purely on, I, I don't really like dogmatically placing piece evaluations anyway, because chess knowledge has evolved to the point where people understand that activity, the ability to create threats is often much more important than just, oh, I'm up five for three for a rook versus a bishop, but if a bishop is, you know, crushing me on the light squares, everybody knows now that, okay, like, it's not that simple. So, yeah. But but there is something to be said for the fact that 
the goal of this Alapin line you're playing is generally to look for opportunities to simplify, mainly because your positional advantage is only effective as pieces come off the board, whereas Black's positional advantage is effective immediately, and with pieces fighting over the center, you could argue that Black usually has a better time like winning some of those battles. So like as I'm setting the tone for our game, we need to be following theory and looking for what the what the most accurate ways are. There's a reason why Afromea or other guys will play certain lines that maybe look to either get pieces behind this three on two so that what I'm saying isn't true and white can actually execute this maybe more aggressively than you would normally think. Or they look to trade pieces because simplification is um, is where white wants the game to go. Another reason why the three on two is something to watch out for over the four on three. Let's say I'm just going to like make some moves. Like let's say some yeah. natural moves happen here. And this is not really a stretch. Um, in fact, that doesn't work because of this. So we actually have to we lose another tempo. So, you know, black, I'm just going to make some random moves. What? Knight C4 is good there. What? What's wrong with knight C4? Oh, yeah, no, knight C4 is good here. Okay, so I, that's another reason why we're going to come back to why E5 has to be a little bit careful for black. But, okay, if, if E4 happens, then you're going to get the D4 square, and this is sort of a key point to the line, right? Yep. Staying on the positional lesson, though, I guess I guess so. Let's even say this happens; it doesn't really matter. I just want to I want to get to a position where I'm talking about another thing to watch out for is that what a, what a four on three can do that a three on two can't do is is launch two pawns in an assault, whereas you could never push two pawns in front of your king without permanently creating weaknesses. But a right. king can hide behind two pawns that your king can't hide behind. Mm -hmm. So it's another reason why really white wants to be. Uh, active in the middle game, challenging the e-pawn, as you said, with knight c4, but looking at a lot of times opportunities to simplify can help white if you don't want if you don't want black's four on three majority to be like a positional advantage in the middle game. Okay. Is this making sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, expecting a6 and knight f3, now there's, there's okay, so there's theory here after after a6 and, and, and knight a3, um, the Okay, knight c4 is also a move we can consider right away, not just knight f3, right? Yeah, but, I mean, as soon as they go e6, knight c4 is natural for me. Right, because they're playing e6 and gaining a tempo anyway, so you kind of have to move the knight. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, bishop, bishop to g4 is a possibility after knight f3, uh, but it's not like it's, it's uh, you know, super effective anyway, if yeah. we're... Yeah, and there's some other strong players or, playing I mean, this line too. Um, I, I might just go h3. Yeah, bishop g4, h3, bishop h5 is is kind of the main line, right? Yeah, and then just let it be. And now there's a couple different moves here for white. Do you know what they are? Uh, no, but I can guess. Okay, well, what do you think? This is uh, where we get in. We, we've kind of transposed back from a, a less common move order into something that has been played by a lot of those names that I was talking about. Zygchalko, uh, Rosenthalis, Sveshnikov, your book author. Uh, Kostinyuk, Alexandra Kostinyuk, the women's world champion. She's also uh, a regular player of this line. Uh, Bishop E2. Okay. Bishop E2 is totally fine, but one of the, one of the advantages that you have of... Of having an open center early is 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 there are times where you can dynamically force your way into a better middle game instead of let me just get developed and castled and then I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. So the best move here for White if Black goes into this line is actually Queen A4 check immediately, and the point is um, is that after Knight to D7, mm -hmm. White has two moves. One of them is is a move that breaks your your thought that you might not ever castle long because this is actually not a bad move at all for White to consider. Giving up the bishop pair is hardly worth the double pawns when you've given up, you know, such an important piece for so many open diagonals. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other move here for white, probably the most popular move, is bishop to f4 with tempo so that you can use the e4 square for the knight. Sorry, the e5 square. So, you and I will be analyzing this more further as the game gets, as, the, as we as it becomes more clear what both sides are trying to do and, and what line, I guess, the world votes on. But I, that's why I kind of wanted to focus less on theory and what we might face and more on, you know, challenging like your bigger picture mindset of like, hey, so what are you thinking about long term? Of all the things you've said so far, I would say the only things like I would really correct are um, one, I think white should be open to a castle's long in some positions because an accelerated development and control over the only open file on the board mm -hmm. is is critical for a position that's already open. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, right. 
The second thing is often I think white because of the potential. Uh, okay, like because of the potential risks, if black can establish e5 safely, you already pointed out to me that you know right, you know knight, knight c4 is often okay. But even with other moves like this whole queen a4, bishop f4 idea, if white can prevent black from doing what is normally what 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 would be a positional advantage for him, then usually white is on the right road. So that's restricting e5, taking advantage of the open lines earlier than black can, and not allowing black to just have the only pawn in the center that restricts white's pieces. It's sort of like the overall strategy that both sides are playing for. Okay. Is that making any sense? So I'm still... Let me just think about this for a second. Remember, h3 was the move here first. Yeah, h3. Uh, why castle queenside over castle kingside when you can just bring the rook to d1? Well, one, it, it, it's, it you get there faster you immediately have a rook on d1, whereas you're talking two moves instead of one if the ultimate goal is to get control over the file. And number two, your main your main hesitancy about this has nothing to do with casting long. It has to do with you're afraid your king is not going to find safety over here because of the open position. Am I right? Mm -hmm. So that's what you're... That's what you're apprehensive about the thing the question is this right we want to we want to recognize the potential for weaknesses but never see ghosts in chess okay so yes if you gave your opponent the this diagonal with the bishop and and maybe a battery with the queen mm -hmm. yeah i mean it, it's very scary yeah. then we start asking ourselves what's the concrete possibility for black to really take advantage of the white king here mm -hmm. um and in a lot of lines the answer is there really isn't one Okay. Um, the the initiative that you're gaining in an early open position is is critical. As, as is, of course, long term king safety. We're not undervaluing that, but it's just thinking about it in concrete terms of what would I do to challenge Black's development in the most in the most accurate way. The most the most common thing you want to do, I already know your style, is again, like, so you, you play an opening, you feel it's a little bit less theoretically challenging, um, you know some of the ideas, you've got some bigger picture stuff in mind, but overall, you're just looking to play chess. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that, but the other way to think about it is, as you get better, there's a reason why style goes out the window as players evolve. It's, it's, um, it's a... It, you can't really choose to play positions you're comfortable with if they're not the best way to play the position and expect to be the best players. Which in this case, of course, the world is the best player because they're all going to be voting together and, and finding the best moves. So what I would do is like maybe at home right now before their move is made, I would spend this week challenging yourself to learn a little bit more about the lines, less to remind yourself of what you're comfortable with and more to challenge yourself to expand your knowledge of the current position that you're playing. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and and again, like in a critical game, like you don't, you wouldn't sit down to an over the board game where you don't have a lot of time and then make up something. That's not what you would ever. It'd be like changing a game plan, you know, in any sports game, right? Hashtag insert unnecessary sports cliche with John Urshel, right? We know that I was going to do that, but at least I haven't talked about like a one dimensional, like you know, quarterback who only wants to throw down field as a comparison to someone who only wants to play openings a certain way. That would have been really dumb, right? Uh, yeah. But but what I'm challenging you to think of is you're, you're, you're comfortable with the idea of bishop e2 and castle short because those are positions you've played before. Mm -hmm. But I can already say that if you, don't challenge, if you don't challenge Black's development scheme, the chances of him establishing the dream position I'm talking about, okay, maybe again you come back to this and get this, but already here, like I don't like that light square bishop trade, mm -hmm. and I don't like b5 coming either. So if your queen's on a4, that means already, so you're saying, well, I don't want to put my queen on a4 because that's not the line I'm comfortable with. So then we're going back to here. So in order to avoid getting things we're not comfortable with, we're already compromising what the best approach is in a position earlier and earlier on. This isn't just a you problem. This is what a lot of chess players do. And so, like, this is an opportunity in playing this game to, like, be like, all right, like, let's analyze the theory in this line and really see what might be the best ways to take advantage of Black's approach. Because you have the time. You have... You know, more than more than twenty four hours, really. Once a move is made, right? You have a lot of time there. Mm -hmm. um, so, what do you think? I can tell you're not happy with your coach. What do you What do you want to say? What? No comments. Okay, I'm happy. coach you're, me up, man. You're, you're liking it. I'm liking it. Okay, good. And so, um, 
the theory, and, and okay, I did some preparation before our video just because I didn't want to just show up and totally pull a Danny's winging and doesn't know what he's talking about. But beyond like the positional stuff that you do need, I do need to employ you to keep in mind. Keep in mind, the general things I talk about, even if the concrete suggestion I made initially that E5 didn't work for Black John, like it's still important to always establish, okay, if both sides had five moves, this is what Black's goal would be. If both sides had five moves, this is what White's side would be, right? And we're not talking, you know, like I would go there, there, dirt, dirt, right? I, we're not talking like, you know, you're playing fantasy chess here. We're talking about what are the goals? Where would you put all your pieces to improve the goal? And sometimes you ask questions of that of players and they're like, well, I don't really know. I, I would just get my pieces out because that's what I'm thinking I'm supposed to do. And, and so I'm challenging you to think there is probably a best place for all the pieces here. And it has to do with what the pawns are always telling us. They're the soul of every position. So white has a, white has a soul over here on the queen side. Black has some goals that he would try to establish in the middle game in that perfect world. Dr. Evil quotation fingers. Um, but I would challenge you to realize the most theoretically relevant lines are going to be ones that actually bring a little more pressure to Black's perspective and try to use White's development advantage and the potential uh, to accelerate uh, an aggressive middle game rather than just sort of easing into getting castled short where you might actually see the worst potential parts of White's line come to fruition. Does that make sense? No, that makes sense. Okay. And this is something you should be thinking about with all your openings. And, and so... Um, so if we get, here's, so let's come back to it. So this is my advice, and I know that half the players from the world will be like, um, you know, trying to vote differently from what Danny suggests, which then they'd be falling into my trap, because I know <laughs> that what I'm about to suggest is the best moves for black. And that is that, so let's say that after knight f3, we don't get um, bishop to g4, because bishop g4 is that, I, I was trying to like build into this whole little rant I went on, but bishop g4 is actually not the best line for black after h3 because of exactly the kind of theory I'm giving you. Uh, I'll quiz you real quick. Obviously, black can't play b5 here, right? Why is that? Uh, just take with the knight. Right, just or the bishop, right? Because the pawn, or the everyone who, who doesn't know, is pinned to the rook on a8. So... So that's an issue, and and so it it means that that line I just gave is is pretty much forced whether you saw knight c6 or knight to d7 because this little inner mizzo followed by an executing uh, idea of coming into the square is really strong. The queen can't come to b6 to try to penalize early development schemes of leaving the b2 pawn behind because you're always going to have a tempo here. So so you know just imagine the potential of getting the initiative a little more faster than you might normally, right? And again, the absence of this bishop being on this side of the board still makes tactics like this almost non-existent for black because the threats just get out of control over here. So um, so this is how we're going to look to take advantage of that if black plays the bishop g4 line. But I'm going to back up and say that I don't think bishop to g4 is actually the best move on knight f3. Just developing knight b to d7 is probably a little more solid Essentially, for all the reasons I've kind of described, will some of the exact theory change? Yes, but that's one thing. So I gave all these I, I gave all these ideas for you to take home about how you want to know the positional bigger picture, so you know where to put your pieces, right? Yeah. But the same applies for tactics that commonly occur out of your opening. In fact, there was a great book series for a while, which was called like Tactics in the Grunfeld, Tactics in the Nightorf, Tactics in the Blank, Tactics in the Blank, right? And, and it had that exact mindset where it's not just about, you know, pawn structures in the night or pawn structures of your opening and knowing how to find plans, but it's like, here's 30 tactical patterns that commonly occur out of the Alapin Sicilian. You'd love that, right? You'd eat that up. Awesome. And so, like, that's how you want to think about what we're doing here, too, is like, okay, maybe they don't play Bishop G4, or maybe they do. Maybe in some games, you get someone to, you know, misplace their light squared bishop and allow tactics that are similar to that, even if it wasn't exactly the same move order that we went over here. So as you become more familiar with common tactical patterns that occur in your own openings, it makes you just that much more dangerous. And it sort of, it sort of gives you this like alarm clock muscle where as soon as somebody goes something wrong, at first you don't know and you're like, but something doesn't smell right here, right? And you're like, something's wrong. And that allows you to look further than you would have otherwise. So um, anyway, so that's why knight to b to d7 is, is kind of a common move here. Uh, one of the top games here is um, Zatonsky versus uh, Wojta uh, Wojkiewicz. Uh, rest his soul, no longer with us. Napomniashishi played this position as black back in 2003, but that was before he was Napomniashishi, so we don't care. Um, Okay, but you know, so we, we look again at, at the idea of queen a4 as a common move in this position, although I'm already going to say that because chess is an ebb and flow of like one side making a concession versus the other, already the fact that black played knight bd7 
What does that do to his queen site? Uh, slows development. Slows development down. So we're sacrificing bishop g4 mm -hmm. uh, and not weakening our light squares for getting for for not weakening our light squares, but we slow it down. So already here, if we get this, I could say that you know a more natural developing move followed by castle short is already a little more playable for white than before. Even with e5 getting established, black has sort of made a concession of his position that he doesn't have the most ideal development. You know, and so like you know we start to see that okay, like someone makes one concession and they give up something else, and that may makes our you know perspective a little different too. Uh, but even with that, I think queen a4 still makes the most sense in the position, and mainly because the pressure here is annoying. b5 is still not a possibility because you can just chop alicious. And again, coming back to I think probably the only overall thing I've, I've sort of said would be quote-unquote wrong of what you've said so far is, is it again opens up this possibility that castles long followed by an aggressive assault of black's king side uh, or sorry a black center before he gets the king to the king side um, is a real possibility for white mm -hmm. okay so after queen a4 let's see so um, e6 is a move uh, taking taking a, a page out of the book we've already seen so far what would you guess is probably a move here for white to consider knight c4 Knight to c4, for sure, in the sense that you're avoiding the trade, but actually that would be a blunder here. Uh, what move can black play here? Uh, let me see for a sec. Ah, yeah, yeah, of course. No, that's bad. That's e5, really right? Bad. Yeah. Okay. Remember that knight c4 is your knee-jerk reaction to e6, the one you already had in your mind before our lesson started here today, because you're almost always used to it being a necessity due to the threat of doubling the pawns. Mm -hmm. With your queen on a4, noted should be that this is not really a positional right. threat. Four. Giving up the dark square bishop is is not really the greatest thing that black could ever do. Right. Yeah, no. Um, sure. So that's one good thing to adjust in your approach. The next mm -hmm. thing is, remember, uh, when I say there's something we already talked about so far as far as a page in the book, it's a, it's a theme I've already suggested as a move for white, especially with the queen on a4. What's Just, a move here for white that sort of takes a little bit of an advantage of where black's pieces are placed and maybe helps you to, to, to expose black's king in the center? Just castle long? Castle's right. long would be my second candidate move. Okay. Um, uh, and, uh, and honestly, you couldn't go wrong with this move. I think, okay. I think it's fine. I mean, I guess I should probably check the engine, but that would be illegal, everybody at home. And this is a real chess vote chess game. So, I, But I'm just going to say right. intuitively, I don't think it's the most accurate move. That's right. Well, give me five more seconds. Okay. This isn't Jeopardy, you know. This isn't... Dude. I know it's not Jeopardy, but... I, uh, I mean, live on the wild side. I mean, Bishop B5... Taking so. advantage of the pin pawn is is definitely like it should just be on the radar as far as a tactical pattern radar, that occurs, but, but you don't want to force it. Wild side. But. So let's let's come back to the idea that I said we already. It's easy to see the threats of of the queen on the diagonal and the fact that the pawn is pinned, but that whole line I already highlighted earlier, the subtle intermezzo move, is only possible oh, because of the queen. Bishop, uh, yeah, bishop f four. Bishop f four, right? That's the best move here, and. Um, Okay, so what are the options for black? You know, if he looks to trade queens because he's panicking due to the pressure, well, now you're thrilled to have an end game where the three on two is definitely better than a four on three, and you've you've destroyed black's structure in the process. So that's not a candidate move for black. E five, not they a candidate can play move for if they black. Want. What? No, that they're they're still allowed to play it if they want. Yes, they are, and the world should remember that. That's right. Remember John's advice. And well, so. Welcome to play that. That's right. So the best move after bishop f4 is or sorry, bishop f4 is probably um, either queen to c5 or you can try to get away with bishop d6. But bishop d6 is is sort of risk it to get the biscuit chess. Isn't isn't it's not a move in the database? But I'm looking at this. I'm assuming knight to b5 looks like something we would have. Forktown USA, and if he takes, we don't want to take a8 and give him two pieces for the rook, but we'll play an inner mizzo. So if right. it goes to the end game, well then fine because you know, you know. I mean, this is phenomenal for White, right? Bishop pair, deliciousness, awesomeness. Um, and if they take here, then we'll take here. So now we've won the exchange outright. So that's a little tactico, courtesy of authentic calculation. Something I rarely do in life anymore. So I, I think I think that's the idea that would prevent Bishop B six, which means if we're coming back to Queen to C five being the only move. 
one, we have a forced draw, little tempo town if we want to take it with the world. Two, we have two good plans. I think, again, developing the bishop and getting castled makes sense from the perspective that we force black to make some concessions. We're not as aggressively worried about black's positional idea I foreshadowed of getting e5 in. And yeah. we can also castle long. I mean, I don't think this pawn is really a capturable piece, but I think we'll figure that out once we get there. Okay. So in hindsight, what are some of the takeaways of our lesson today? This is, again, the live position. All right. Takeaways? Takeaways from everything we've talked about as far as things you've learned, right. both specifically about yeah. your chess yeah. in, in the criticism I gave and also about, about the position overall. Okay. So here's what's going on. I'm looking at this position, and yeah, I'm making plans for development, but I'm not straight up attacking black. And why don't we try to make some moves to try to get something going? So... I've got this three on two, which is very good for me on the queen side when pieces go off the board, but pieces are not off the board right now. Right, so I need right. to be aggressive because black is trying to get something going in the middle. They've got this four on three, strong moves like e5, maybe they bring the other pawn as well, something like, you know, f5 later or something. This gives some strength. Right, right. Um, I learned, you know, about this... Uh, tactic that seems like a big theme going on with the uh, the rook over there, the pawns and the rook. Right. This right. is an important tactic to keep in mind. I can castle queenside because although, you know, it looks somewhat scary, really there's no concrete plans for black right now, and it doesn't seem to be any in the kind of near future. Uh, if I have my way, it's better to trade down to an endgame because in the endgame, that queenside majority is going to be good for me. So, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, that and, queen and a other... move is Sorry, something. Uh, given the option, I'm down to simplify. Right. That's all I was saying. Okay. And, and then that pattern of, of the bishop f4 move that seemed like a common way for white to sort of increase pressure here, right? Mm-hmm. I say pattern anytime it occurs twice, right? We know that it's something we have to look for. We say triangle, triangle, square, triangle, triangle, and you guess square. Based on the information you have at this point, this is the most common pattern you could guess. And then someone says triangle, triangle, square, triangle, triangle, circle, triangle, triangle, square, triangle, triangle, and now you would guess, circle. right? Circle. Based on the information you have to a certain point, you make the best practical guess. And that's really what chess is that is very similar to... I guess, practical math. I don't even want to venture into your field because you'll destroy me. But what I would say is you don't always have the ability to calculate things out to the end. So what you can judge yourself on is not whether you calculated things to the end, John, but did you make the best possible guess based on the information and knowledge you had to that point? Or did you do something that was biased towards your own like comfort zone or you weren't really sure, you didn't push yourself? And in chess games, you want to push yourself to, to be you know, making the best guess you can based on the current understanding of the position. So I'm trying in these lessons to improve your understanding of the position without doing as much like concrete. Here's what I'm expecting theory, although we're doing some of that too, because we want to win. Let's be honest. We don't want oh, the world, speaking, you know, you know, this of, isn't just about growing. So, as a all right. Comment, I, just I think all, you all your athlete friends are going to watch this and maybe have fun. I mean, do you have athlete friends or you have friends like me? Like, what's your deal? Wait, or did you just try to imply that I don't have any friends? No, that's not what I said. I meant, do you that have... That is definitely what I just heard. No, what I said was, you're like such an anomaly with your, with your, you know, amazing, like, love for chess and math. I'm like, do you just go in and, like, you know, crush some people and then go back to the drawing board, or do you hang out with football players? Uh, of course I hang out with football players. Just, I mean, I've played football all my life. I was just asking. Best friends or guys on the Ravens or guys on other teams now. Right. Uh, right. My friends from college, like, or my other offensive linemen. I mean, I'm in one of my friends' weddings this summer. Who's that? Center. Oh, can I come That's to the wedding? Time. Hey, man, you're welcome to come. Right. North Carolina in July. It'll, <laughs> okay. It'll be a hot one. It'll be a hot. That sounds hot. Um, no, I was kidding. I was just joking that you're, uh, you know, I, I imagine you after this lesson just like going to the drawing board and writing like Goodwill Hunting algorithms on the mirror behind you. You know, and just like just really diving into some deep math. Oh yeah, I'm. Once we're done with this, I gotta I gotta hit some math. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> right. But let this be known. Uh, I talked to Hess a little bit. Right. And Hess has a request. Okay, great. Here we go. So 
he wants to know when him and I will get matching chess.com blazers because he wants one. He wants a chess.com blazer and he feels like you're the ticket to making me get off get off my you know what and do it. Yep. So he I, wants I think one. the only way I can respond to that is as soon as you and I get blazers, he gets a blazer. Wait, you don't have a blazer? We assumed so he said Nakamura like pre, he's pretty sure he has a blazer and he thinks you have a blazer. No, I think we gave Hikaru a pin that he puts on his blazer. And so it looks like it's custom. Okay. But we I, we got to get something going with that. You're right. I got to, so you know. There's no chess.com blazers. This isn't a real not that thing. I, I don't think we have that yet, but we need to do it. So it'll but it's on it's you, on the to-do list. If you don't know about it, then it probably doesn't exist. It, it's true. No, it is. I, I do run our gear. I run like a, a shipping thing out of my attic. It's crazy. But all right, man. No, this has been great. Hopefully, um, Hopefully uh, we get some comments, everybody. Please let us know how you feel about this. Give us, uh, give us your feedback on the, on the interactive analysis here. John, I know you're going to share this video with, uh, with all, all your friends. Yep. Challenge them to, um, I, don't know, I wonder if they could follow what we're doing. This will just show everybody, like, well, you know, you're like, you're like, you know, chessing on another level, man. <laughs> so, all right, I don't know. I'm trying. I'm sounding more and more like an idiot dork right now. I just need to stop talking. No, no such thing. I, no, I, there is a thing. I am that thing. But um, I legitimately appreciate. You. Yeah. Well, you're uh, you're you're awesome. We're gonna have another video, everybody, in a few more moves. Um, so get get uh, go ahead and click on the link here in our intro and uh, sign up for the vote chess game. Get your game on against John and uh, and me as we as we team up to take you down and. Uh, and all right, John, till the next video, let's uh, let's kind of keep this game going against the world. All right, sounds good. All right, man.